So hello everybody and welcome to today's uh, Journal of Physiology Journal Club. Uh, my name is Antonio Rodriguez. I'm a postdoctoral fellow um, at the Department of Critical Care at St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto and I'll be hosting the Journal, uh, journal Club today. Uh, the article we are discussing today is entitled Oxygen, Oxygen Oxygenation Pattern and Compensatory Responses to Hypoxia and Hypopnea Following Bilateral Cardiobody Resection in Humans. Um, by Dr. Piotr Nowinski from the Department of Heart Diseases, um, Wrocław uh, Medical University, Poland, and colleagues. And it was first published in the Journal of Physiology um, in February this year. Um, Dr. Uh, Nowinski, the first author of the paper, will be joining us today um, to present the study. And then Dr. Harold Schutz, senior editor from the Journal of Physiology, will also be joining us today uh, to discuss uh, the key factors that made this study met the standards for publication in the Journal of Physiology. Uh, Dr. Um, Piotr Nowinski is a clinical scientist and active cardiologist specializing in heart failure and invasive electrophysiology. Uh, he received his PhD from the Rothwell uh, Medical University in 2015 for his research focused on the pathophysiology of peripheral chemoreceptors in systolic heart failure. He conducted the first human trials of carotid uh, body modulation and is a member of the Polish Society of Cardiology and the European Society of Cardiology. Dr. Harold Schultz is a senior editor from the Journal of Physiology and a professor of physiology uh, at the Department of Cellular and Integrative Physiology at the University of Nebraska College of Medicine with a major interest in sensory and motor functions of uh, the autonomic uh, nervous system. Um, his laboratory is devoted to studying chemo and bioreflex regulation of cardiorespiratory function in health and exercise, and how these reflexes are altered in diseases such uh, as heart failure. So, so thank you very much to both of you for taking the time to participate in the journal club uh, with us today. Uh, I also would like to thank uh, Jose and Imahan for uh, all the support on behind the scenes to organizing this journal club. So thank you very much. So just before we start, I would like to uh, go through how the session will work. So the journal club will be composed of two parts. The first part we just started is a 45 minute section that uh, will be composed by this intro introduction. Then um, Dr. Nowinski will have a presentation around 20 to 20, 25 minutes, we will have a question uh, part. So uh, you can uh, ask your questions and we can discuss uh, those questions with um, Yoti. And then we will have five minutes at the end of the session so that, that Dr. Harry Schuss can comment with us about the reasons that uh, made this paper be accepted in the Journal of Physiology. So, Please do ask your questions. You can do that um, using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you can ask your questions anonymously if you prefer, but uh, we would appreciate if you share your name and from where you are attending the session with us so we can have a more uh, close, let's say, interaction as, uh, as we can have with Zoom meetings. Um, you can also upvote questions uh, that other people have, have asked, and then we will try to address those questions first. And also, the session is being recorded, but your face is not uh, being recorded, so just the session. And then uh, the session will be sent to you uh, within a week after uh, today. Uh, after uh, this first part of the session, we will have a networking session, and I extended discussion uh, with uh, Dr. Nowinski and Dr. Harry Schultz. The Zoom link for the networking session will be available to you close to the end of the session um, today. The network session will last uh, 30 minutes and will be um, sometime we can have a more informal discussion, a more casual discussion. So also, uh, I would like to let you know if you want to get involved with the journal, we, you can do so, for example, by hosting a future meeting of the Journal of Physiology Virtual Journal Club. You can write a journal club article in a recent 
paper that was published in the journal or submit your research to the Journal of Physiology. If you have any question about these specific points, please feel free to reach the emails uh, that are on the, on the slide. So right now I will stop sharing my screen and then I will uh, let Dr. Nubinsky uh, to present his findings to us. So thank you very much um, again, Dr. Nubinsky, and please uh, the floor is yours. Hello everyone, my name is Piotr Nubinsky. I am a cardiologist with a special uh, interest in translational science. And today I have this great honor to present to you the results of our um, recent study which dealt with bilateral carotid body resection. And first question we probably should ask ourselves is, well, why on earth would anyone would like to get rid of both carotid bodies, which are the sole, the main sensors of hypoxia in humans? Why would you, why, why would you do that? Uh, you need to realize that in certain disease states, such as heart failure, resistant hypertension, altered glucose metabolism, tonic uh, afferent input from arterial hemoreceptors does translate into increased sympathetic tone. And this increased sympathetic tone is definitely detrimental to our patients. It does increase vascular resistance. It does increase sodium reabsorption. It's proarrhythmogenic and the heart rate goes up because of it. And quite often you could, you might encounter this paradigm of a vicious circle of enhanced sympathetic activity, which makes the heart failure or other disease worse. And that disease getting worse through different mechanisms, also involving arterial chemoreceptors do increase, does increase the sympathetic tone. So here you go, the classical vicious circle. And Sometimes the only way to cut this circle, to stop it from rolling, from haunting our patients would be to remove one of the links of this chain. And in our case, this link is the arterial chemoreceptors, the peripheral chemoreceptors. Okay, but the next question would be, should we go for both carotid bodies? And as you perfectly well know, we have two such organs strategically located on both sides on the, of the neck in the bifurcation of the common carotid artery, or maybe we should go just for, for one. Would one be enough? So let's have a look at um, some papers to find this answer. And here you can appreciate our paper from a few years ago, in which we showed that, um, and this is the left lower panel, and please look at the solid lines. If you get to read, if you cut off, two carotid bodies, then indeed you might expect virtual elimination of the activity of it, which in that case was measured with HVR, hypoxic ventilator response. So after bilateral removal, it's simply gone. While if you take out only one carotid body, the response in terms of HVR, in terms of hypoxic ventilator response is kind of unpredictable. It tends to go down, or maybe it stays at the same level, dotted lines. And then if you look at the sympathetic response, because that was our primary end point in this particular study, it was measured directly with MSNA, microneurography, you would find out that bilateral surgeries, they did decrease the MSNA by roughly 13, 14%. One on average, unilateral ones decreased MSNA only by 5%. So one would think that bilateral surgery might give you a better results in terms of sympathetic tone reduction. And then the next paper came into the field, the paper from Professor Patton group, uh, which was about a small group of patients with resistant hypertension. In that particular study, carotid body resection was done only on one side, only unilaterally. And the whole study, overall, it was neutral. However, in half of the participants, a significant decrease in MSNA and blood pressure was found. And interestingly, 
Interestingly, the so-called responders, they were characterized by significantly greater hypoxic ventilatory response. So the measure of CB reactivity to hypoxia uh, than the patients that did not respond. So one might say that HVR by itself could be a target for the intervention, meaning again, that we would probably would like to go with HVR as low as possible. And to achieve this low level, probably we would like to get rid of both carotid bodies. Okay, but would that be safe? So again, carotid bodies are the main sensors of hypoxia. So what would happen if you have a individual who has, let's say, obstructive sleep apnea to start with? What would happen if we put our heart failure patients after a bilateral resection on the plane, on the transatlantic flight? I'm sure you are aware that in the pressurized cabin of the aircraft, but the oxygen content is roughly 15%. What about high altitude? So we are talking about alpine peaks of two, three, 4,000 meters. What would happen then? Finally, what about uh, symptoms of, let's say, acute heart failure decompensation? Would the patients with heart failure be able to sense the important symptoms of the disease properly? All these questions, they shout for answers. And that's not all. We are also interested in the hemodynamic response. Okay, so we don't have carotid bodies. So we expect the lack of ventilatory response, but how about hemodynamic response? What would happen to heart rate, cardiac output, SVR, blood pressure, if you expose them to hypoxia? And then finally, what if such a patient is exposed to a complete respiratory failure. So a mixture of not only hypoxia, but combined hypoxia and hypercapnia. Would the central hypercapnic reactivity, would it be strong enough to maintain the saturation at the distant level? So in our paper, mostly because of the safety reasons, we would like to answer at least some of these questions. Um, that's why we devised our protocol, which basically consisted of two parts. The first part I would call a prolonged hypoxia. So um, we dealt with a small group of patients. It's just four of them. Unfortunately, there is nothing we could do about it. We are only left with four surviving patients five years after a bilateral carotid body resection. So the group was small. All these patients, five years after the surgery, in this first part of the protocol, all of them were exposed to four different gas mixtures. So it was 15% oxygen, which is indeed an equivalent of um, pressurized aircraft cabin, then 12% oxygen, which is approximately comparable to the altitude of 4,500 meters above the sea level. The third mixture was a mixture of 12% hypoxia plus hypercapnia of 5%. And that was to emulate, to simulate the setting of complete respiratory failure. And then the last, the last mixture that we exposed them to was a mixture of hypercapnia plus hyperoxia. And that was done in order to sort of isolate um, isolate central, the central component of the ventilatory reactivity by silencing peripheral chemoreceptors with hyperoxia. Obviously, we do silence that in the control groups because in the CBD group, there is nothing to be silenced, basically. Um, so all these responses were compared to the heart failure patients and healthy volunteers with preserved carotid bodies. And in the second part of the protocol, we used an acute hypoxia. So this time, not a gas mixture is given for five to 10 minutes, but very short bursts of nitrogen given for a few seconds. I would say between 10 and 30 seconds, so maybe 
it's better to say for a few breaths. And this methodology uh, was used, has had been used for years. In fact, the very first papers in heart failure from early 90s from Professor Ponikowski, who's my boss uh, group, they did use the same methodology or very similar methodology in which you give short bursts of nitrogen, pure nitrogen coming from the gas tank. And for each exposure to nitrogen, what we are looking for is the lowest value uh, of the, um, let's make it, the lowest value of the saturation and the highest value of the ventilation. So we have two values. In that way, we can plot a point on the chart. So we have one point for every nitrogen and exposure. And in between all these points, we draw a regression line, regression function, and the slope of that function is simply a measurement of hypoxic ventilatory response, or as you wish, acute peripheral chemosensitivity in terms of ventilation, because we also do the same for blood pressure, heart rate, and SVR. So to summarize our measurements, I, I would say that from the acute part of the protocol, we measured acute chemosensitivity. So again, HVR, SBP, heart rate, and SVR slope. And from the prolonged part of the protocol, we simply measured the changes uh, between the last minute of the baseline and the last minute of every exposure. And that was measured for, for all ventilatory and hemodynamics parameters, which I'm going to show you in a minute. We also had a close look at the saturation values, which were averaged from every minute of every exposure. We, uh, we uh, also extracted the minimal saturation for every gas prolonged exposure. And then, especially for this paper, we devised a new method to look at the so-called short-term variability of saturation. So, so what we did is we used this moving time frame methodology. So basically, we had this 60-second moving window, which was moving from left to right into the exposure period. And within this moving window, we were looking for the greatest drop, for the greatest decrease in saturation, which was a measure of the short term 60 second variability of saturation. Um, so now let's have a look at the, at the results. First, you must appreciate that the hypoxic ventilatory response. So ventilatory chemosensitivity five years after bilateral carotid body resection was virtually eliminated. One might say, well, there is something 0 0.17. It went down from 1.0 to 0 0.17, but 0 0.1 is well within the noise of the method. So with um, confidence, I can say, there is no ventilatory response left at all in these patients five years after the procedure. So no compensatory regrowth, which had been uh, described, for example, in animals, uh, in animal models. In humans, we, we don't see that phenomenon. Now, let us look at the uh, changes in ventilatory parameters when our patients are exposed to prolonged uh, hypoxia. So now it's not about short burst of nitrogen. Now it's about five, 10 minutes of hypoxia. And again, there is no change in ventilation. So these patients, they don't respond in mild ventilation to hypoxia, whether it is mild or moderate. However, what is interesting is the fact that the central reactivity, so the hypercapnic reactivity, regardless if it is with a hypoxia or with hyperoxia, it is maintained. Now, what about hemodynamics? What about hemodynamic parameters? Uh, well, I was quite surprised by the fact that the cardiac output response to hypoxia and bilaterally resected patients, patients was preserved. And that was mediated 
by two factors. The first one was the rise in heart rate, which was seen in all patients. And the other one was a decrease in SVR, again seen in all studied patients. What is also quite interesting was a trend towards a hypotension in most of the studied individuals following bilateral CB resection. And that was probably the result of decreased SVR. Well, so if our patients are deprived of carotid bodies, then how come can they respond in terms of cardiac output? There must be surely uh, some other sensor of hypoxia in these individuals as, and yes, indeed, we believe that the sensor of hypoxia in terms of hemodynamic changes, the sensor is most likely the aortic bodies. So that's a slide from our different paper from 2014, in which we show using similar group of patients that before and after bilateral carotid body resection, the re response in terms of heart rate to acute hypoxia is quite the same. There is no ventilatory response, but the heart rate response is maintained. Interestingly, the blood pressure response diminished. Um, and now the main point of the whole study, which is the saturation. So on this slide, you can clearly see that if you give the bilaterally resected patient a mild hypoxia, if we expose them to the 15% oxygen, we can expect roughly 5% lower saturation comparing to heart failure patients with preserved carotid bodies. If we expose them to moderate hypoxia of 12%, then the difference between carotid body resected and preserved patients would be of around 10%. When you look at these results, you should always keep in mind that we are talking about blood oxygen saturation. And you should keep in mind the shape of the hemoglobin dissociation curve, which is not a flat line, but a uh, parabola, I would say. So um, let's say in the, in the heart failure patient with preserved carotid bodies, uh, when exposed to 12% hypoxia, you will, you will expect a drop in saturation from 95 to 90%. So in that case, we are operating still within the flat part of the curve. But if it goes down in bilateral resected patient from 95 to 80%, now we are operating within the steep part of the curve so actually the situation might be much worse than it looks from looking at the saturation on this chart. So the true values of the oxygen partial pressure, well, they might be even worse. Here I'm showing briefly the minimal um, uh, saturation extracted from every exposure. And again, the difference between resected and preserved patients is of about 10%. And uh, you might ask myself, is such a difference of 10% in minimal saturation clinically relevant? And I'm a cardiologist. I work in ICU, intensive care unit, coronary care unit. I have this on calls every now and then. And I can tell you, that if I see on the screen during my own call a saturation of 92%, I'm not too concerned. But if I see saturation of 82%, I am very concerned. I act rapidly. There is something going on definitely. So my take on that is that it, clinically, it is definitely relevant. And we are talking about 15% O2. So the aircraft cabin, yeah, uh, and now the next part of, of the manuscript, which probably, well, in my opinion, probably most interesting is the shape 
is the pattern itself of the oxygen desaturation. If you ask me to describe this pattern in one word, I would probably say instability, instability. Here's an example, just, so, just one individual after bilateral carotid body resection. Uh, upper panel on the left, left hand side, you can see ventilation, tidal volume. And here with the thick red arrows, you can appreciate very short lasting, just few seconds uh, breaks in the ventilation. So the ventilation just for a few moments is just um, a little bit less. And in response to that, we can see this abrupt, profound, irregular drops in saturation. Well, basically what carotid bodies, what peripheral chemoreceptors are providing are the rapid adjustments. And by rapid, I mean breath to breath, maybe even second to second adjustments in ventilation in response to saturation. If we don't have these adjustments, the oxygenation pattern becomes erratic, like in this example. Yes, we are left with a hypercapnic response. It is definitely there, but for, but for hypercapnia to activate the central uh, center as well, the carbon dioxide might, must first dissolve uh, into the cerebrospinal fluid and that does take time. And by that time, the saturation might go down a lot. And that's what actually happens to these patients. Mm. So we try to translate with this new methodology I showed you before, we try to translate these observations into numbers. So on your right hand side, you can now see the slopes and the steeper the slope, the greater, the higher is the short-term variability in saturation. And clearly, clearly, I hope that you can see that in bilateral resected patients, this variability is definitely uh, much, much bigger than in patients with or individuals with preserved carotid bodies. Well, you might say that yes, in heart failure patients exposed to let's say 12% oxygen, there is some variability in saturation. And yes, I do agree, but that is for different reason. As a matter of fact, in this group, when exposed to hypoxia in high per percentage of these patients, you will expect an induction of a phenomenon called periodic breathing, the chain stokes respiration, which also would give you variability um, in the ventilation. But this variability, I would say, is irregular. It's, it's, I'm sorry, it's, it's irregular. While in CB restricted patients, this variability is simply erratic, irregular, unpredictable. Uh, so to summarize, our results, I would say first, that five years after bilateral carotid body resection, the absence of AGR persisted. So there is no compensatory regrowth. Uh, when you exposed um, CBR patients to mild or moderate hypoxia, you might expect lower by roughly 10% saturation, and we are talking about average saturation and also minimal saturation. When you compare them obviously to the patients or individuals with preserved carotid bodies. Uh, the short-term variability is much greater in uh, bilateral resected patients comparing to individuals with preserved functionality of carotid bodies. The central reactivity to hypercapnia is preserved and hemodynamic response in terms of cardiac output um, response to hypoxia is also there. So uh, having all this in mind, I'd say it points at several important potential safety issues related to the loss of hypoxic ventilator drive after bilateral CB resection. Well, first, it might worsen obstructive sleep apnea. 
it might lead to profound desaturations during air flights. We gave our, our mixtures just for five, 10 minutes and the air flight, well, it might take a few hours at least. What about high altitude? Uh, what about alcohol overuse? If you have a patient without coated bodies and you blunt the central uh, chemoreceptors with alcohol, well, they might be left with nothing. And then uh, the last problem would be, again, abnormal awareness of the symptoms of acute decompensation that was not studied in our, in our, in our trial, but this is something to keep in mind. So um, my take on that would be that bilateral carotid body resection, if, if, if any, it should be used with extreme caution only in carefully selected patients and definitely blood oxygenation must be closely monitored and the sleep studies, they should be performed between, before and after the procedure. Having this in mind, we might ask ourselves, what are the future directions then? Well, maybe, maybe we should consider uh, a step back. Maybe we should rethink the idea of unilateral uh, uh, coated body resection or ablation. And we do have some new methodology. Now it's not only about the surgery, we can use radio frequency techniques, or maybe we can, we can use ultrasound based energy. So there are novel ways to remove the carotid bodies uh, transvascularly. But probably the best approach would be to think about pharmacological modulation. And one of the best candidates uh, is probably, uh, are probably the antagonists of the pure energetic receptors. With such an approach, uh, we might be able to have a reversible and also a dose dependent tool. And I hope this is the way forward. And uh, with that, I would like to conclude my speech. If you have any questions, I'm open to answer them. Thank you. So I'm going to stop sharing now. And uh, the next uh, step is probably Professor Schultz who is going to take over. So thank, thanks very much, um, Piotr. Uh, that was very nice. Very interesting data, very interesting paper. So congratulations on that. And uh, I know you have a lot of publications on that um, subject. So it's very nice to be sharing today's journal club with you. So thank you. Um, I think we have a couple of questions here on the Q&A. So we can go first to the questions and then um, let's keep uh, Dr. Um, Schutz's comments uh, to the end of the session, if that's fine for everyone. So uh, we have a first question here, and I think this is, uh, this is very interesting. So I would like to know what I think. So this question comes from um, Benedito Machado. So the question is, first, thank you for your paper and presentation. And then he says, in accordance with Julian Paton's proposal of ribbon cage analogy, the ideal approach should be to identify and disconnect only carotid bodies apparent related to signaling and modulation of sympathetic activity, but keeping intact all afferent fibers related to the respiratory branches of the peripheral chemoreflex. Do you see any chance of such identification in humans in the near future? The idea is lovely, and uh, but uh, the question is, how can we do it? I'm an electrophysiologist as well, so I deal with pacing, with uh, stimulation of the heart, not uh, nerves, not brain. However, well, I can appreciate how difficult it could be to dissect. I mean, dissect the nerve. Um, well, I cannot imagine really how technically this could be done, to be honest with you. Maybe I'm not aware of some novel methodologies, but technically how to dissect the nerve and cut only a few fibers out of it. Well, I cannot really see how that can be done, unfortunately. Not sure what you think. So yeah, that was a really good question. Yeah. If I could maybe 
provide <clears throat> my input on that. Um, I, I think the only way, first of all, uh, uh, the jury's still out on whether or not there is a ribbit effect. So assuming that there is, and uh, this is just an assumption at this point, um, I think the only way that you could address that uh, therapeutically is hopefully the different effort pathways would have different transmitters and you could approach it by way of a transgenic or pharmacological approach. But we don't really have any information right now that could tell us whether or not even that exists. So at this point, it's still a very hypothetical question. Great, great. thanks very much, um, Arut. So I'll move to the second question. This comes from Andrew Holmes. And then he, he thanks you, he, really interesting article and great talk. And his question is, could you comment on the finding that um, carotid bodies which resected uh, heart failure patients did not have any reduction in systemic vascular resistance compared to CHF at baseline, but did display a much larger fall in systemic vascular resistance during hypoxia. Uh, he thought this was a very interesting observation and he got his head around trying to answer this question. So we would like to hear from you. Yeah, well, so um, I think it might be a ma matter of the magnitude of the stimulus maybe. Well, if you um, expose the bilaterally resected patients to hypoxia and compare the response to the heart failure patient in a heart failure, so you are saying that the SVR goes deeper after hypoxia in, in bilateral reset patients. And that is probably because, uh, well, you don't have this sympathetic restraint, uh, which, which is probably left uh, to some extent in the, in the CHF patients. So uh, we are taking some part of this sympathetic restraint, and that's probably why SVR goes deeper in CBR patients compared to CHF patients. And the CBR goes down because of uh, direct vasodilatory uh, um, properties of hypoxia. That's why it goes down. And the magnitude of this, of this change, I think it depends on the amount of of sympathetic restraint that is left. And I'd say that after CBR, uh, it, it is, the, the, there's not so much of it left. Uh, that's, that's how I would try to answer it. Would you like to comment on that, Harold? Well, I was trying to follow what you were saying, Peter, sorry. <laughs> not quite clear on how it is related to sympathetic nerve activity, the, the variability in, in O2 sets. So my understanding of the question was that the question was, what is the origin of the difference in the magnitude of the drop in SVR? That's my understanding. Oh. Uh, why, why SVR goes deeper in CBR patients compared to CHF patients with carotid bodies intact? Yeah. No, right. I, I agree with you. I think it's just simply lack of uh, sympathetic restraint of uh, yeah. the toxic effect on the, on the vasculature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it will go down just because of, to some extent, just because of hypoxia. It's exactly. a direct effect, but then it is modulated by the by the uh, the, the, the restraint. Yeah. Right. I was reading the wrong question. Sorry. <laughs> ah, and but Andrew is also asking about the baseline. Uh, what uh, it would be down at baseline though. Um, so maybe maybe we need a as I well, said at the beginning some sort of stim stronger stimulus to unmask this phenomenon. Maybe. Mm. I don't know. Yeah, good, good for thoughts there. That's good. That's good. 
So yeah, we are moving um, to the end of uh, this first part of the session. There are a couple of questions here. Uh, we can keep uh, it saved and take it into discussion um, at the network session. But now I would like to ask Dr. Harold Schultz to make his comments about the key factors that made this paper uh, met the standards for publication in the Journal of Physiology. So please, um, Harold, thanks very much again. Okay. Well, uh, thank you uh, first, uh, Dr. Rodriguez, for putting together this uh, journal club. I think it has been very interesting and we've had a nice attendance for it. And I, I hope that uh, Peter has been able to provide some new insights to those people that were listening today. But I, I particularly want to congratulate Peter and his group on really a very important study that um, needed to be done. Uh, it was very challenging to do. Um, uh, something that probably never could have been done in the US. Um, and um, I think that they were very successful in uh, the outcomes that they gave. I think the outcome, unfortunately, is not what everyone might have hoped that it would have been. Um, in that um, even though carotid body uh, resection does help to lower sympathetic nerve activity and improve exercise tolerance and quality of life in patients, I think it's pretty clear from both of their studies with both the acute and now this five-year study that um, these patients probably are still at risk of, of uh, becoming hypoxemic when they're put in situations where uh, they're not able to uh, respond adequately to a drop in PO2. So you, you have to wonder then, you know, long-term then the safety factor is still an issue, I think, for this procedure. Um, so as Peter pointed out, um, is um, the alternative approaches. We do, we do know, I think, pretty clearly from many studies that have been done so far that the peripheral chemoreflexes really playing a big role in, in at least in systolic heart failure with um, you know, low, low ejection fraction forms of heart failure. Um, we just need a better way of trying to figure out how to normalize this function. Um, and, um, you know, the, I think, like he said, there's probably, uh, if we could make some advances in a pharmacological approach or a molecular approach that I think is the way we could possibly go in the future, uh, possibly other ways of partially denervating the carotid body is something that can be explored in the future. Um, so, you know, there, it, it's still a question that still needs to be addressed, I think. You know, we can't give up on uh, saying that you just can't do anything with the carotid body. We just have to learn how to manipulate it. Uh, and this is something that could be very useful for other types of cardiovascular disease, hypertension, for example. There are many people that have carotid body hypersensitivity and hypertension. People with sleep apnea uh, have a problem with, with this as well central sleep apnea. So I think that, you know, there's uh, avenues for this therapeutic approach with other types of, of uh, abnormalities as well. Now, what, what makes this paper particularly important and why our journal was very happy to publish it is that um, we do strive at the Journal of Physiology to um, encourage papers that have illustrate uh, new physiological principles and mechanisms that are directly related to systems physiology or pathophysiology. Um, and particularly if papers now that if we can have a, a, a clinical or translational focus. So th this paper um, is really a very, very good example of the type of work 
that fits very nicely with the scope of what the journal would like to publish. Um, I, I think, Peter, I, and, and you know this um, from the review and in your discussion in the limitations of the study is that the, the, the biggest concern that one might have is the very small sample size with an N of four, which precluded a lot of rigorous uh, statistical analysis and probably being able to make more firm conclusions on some things where um, it's, you know, not quite clear that it was something that you might expect to occur in all patients without uh, carotid bodies and heart failure. But I think for the most part, we were pretty um, impressed um, and um, satisfied with the data that you presented because even though you have a very small sample size, it was very clear that the, the major things that were important from this study, and that was the variability that occurred in the O2 saturations in these patients, and the fact that the central chemo reflex maintained its sensitivity. I think that's an important conclusion here as well. We didn't have any plasticity occurring in, in, that was overly evident and central chemoreflex control. These are all really, I think, important outcomes, uh, even though you had a very small sample size, and I think it's clear from the data. So in, in that regard, um, those important things really add new information to what we know about the role of the carotid body in heart failure. And for that reason, this paper is really very important. So that's it. Good job. Thanks. You want to comment on that, Peter? I'm very grateful for this nice, nice words and for the summary. Uh, indeed, the sample was very small. Um, as I said, there is nothing we could do to expand the sample. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and I, I, th I think uh, we wouldn't like to expand it, knowing what we know now, having all these safety issues. It might be the last study on the subject ever. Uh, so, yeah. I, I I I did have one question. Do, are we running out of time? Uh, I I think we are we are good for one more question. Yeah, I think it's fine. Um, you 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 raised this interesting question about uh, the lack of possibly patients not being able to have conscious awareness of decomposition in heart failure. So I, I was just wondering if you actually tried to score dyspnea scores in these patients with exposure to hypoxia and whether they were really experienced uh, consciously dyspnea. Well, they they don't they don't we don't score it systematically, but we always ask them at the end of the study how they felt, and usually they, they said they felt nothing. So in terms of hypoxia, there so was nothing, heard. but the acute decompensation is a different story. So the dyspnea in acute heart decompensation, uh, I would say to, 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 to say it is only hypoxia, it would be a simplification. Yes. There's a lot of uh, things at play, uh, the stretch receptors from lungs, the mechanoreceptors from the heart, from the big vessels, it's all in play. So I hope, that it, it wouldn't be um, lost completely, this awareness of acute at the compensation. I think, I think they would feel it. However, we don't have any proofs. We didn't look at it at that, at that systematically. Okay. That's great. Awesome, awesome discussion. That was a very interesting presentation. I hope everyone enjoyed uh, the Journal Club today. So. Thanks very much again, Piotr. Thanks very much again, sure. Edward, for, for taking the time. You know, you have a very busy agenda. So, yeah, I appreciate that, uh, the effort you made. So, thanks very much. So, for uh, everyone, thank you for attending the session today. I hope you have enjoyed the discussion as well. We are now moving uh, to the second part that will be the networking session. The link should be available 
Yes, it's available at the check function now. So please join us uh, for the networking session, and then we can try to address all the questions that we could not address now in the first part. So again, everyone, thanks very much. I hope you enjoyed, and you will, you will join the next um, Journal of Physiology Journal Club. So thanks very much, and bye-bye.